Good morning to all and my hearty welcome to the 13th webinar of Raman Electronic Webinar Series organized by the Department of Opto Electronics, University of Kerala in conjunction with the Silver Jubilee year. Today, I am very much enlightened as we have the very famous and eminent Indian physicist, Professor Ajay Khattak, as our distinguished speaker. Firstly, I welcome the head of the department, Professor S. Shankar Raman, for the welcome address. Most respected Professor Ajay Khattak, sir, former professor of physics, IIT Delhi, respected Professor Unnikrishnayar, sir, Satnarana sir, C.S. Unnikrishnayar, sir, Nambur, sir, Tiagarajan, sir, my dear colleagues, friends, organizing committee members, students, and esteemed participants of the webinar. Today, we are moving to the 13th webinar in the series, Raman Operating Webinar Series, Rose 2020. The feedback we received from about the 12 webinars conducted so far is excellent. The wide acceptance of ROSE 2020 is getting evident from the overwhelming participation from different countries and various states in India. Now, ROSE 2020 is emerging as the platform of convergence of great minds of optoelectronics all over the world. I express our sincere thanks to all the participants from India and abroad. I request all of you to make this a grand memorable event through effective interaction. It is indeed a matter of pride to introduce our department to all of you in this context as the head of the department during the Silver Jubilee year. The Department of Optical Electronics, University of Kerala is celebrating its Silver Jubilee this year. As part of this, we are organizing a Raman Optronic Webinar Series, ROSE 2020, a virtual international conference in October, November, and December 2020. The department started functioning in 1995 with Professor Unikrishnan Nair as its founder head. The Department of Optical Electronics established with a focus on research in the field of photonics, optoelectronics, and optical communication has emerged as a center of excellence in making significant contributions in various fields of photonics. The department also offers MPhil and MTech programs. The conference aims to provide a platform for young minds to bridge the gap between academia and industry, and also to showcase their innovations through research paper presentations, which is scheduled from 23rd November 2020. I request your active participation by submitting research papers in the conference. ROSE 2020 is blessed by the presence of, by the participation of uh, giants in optoelectronics, not only as speakers, but also as participants. Uh, considering the overwhelming participation and acceptance to the webinar, we are giving live streaming in YouTube and also in our YouTube channel, Raman Optronics. I request all of you to subscribe the channel for viewing the previous webinars. I also request you to complete the registration form through the link given in the chat box for getting the update of future webinars and the remainders. Today, we are fortunate and blessed to have the giant in optoelectronics, Professor Ajay Khatak, with us as the speaker. The department is thankful to you, sir, for accepting our invitation uh, to the webinar and uh, blessing us. I, on behalf of the Department of Optical Electronics, I welcome Professor Ajay Khatak to the webinar series. On behalf of the Department of Optical Electronics, I welcome Professor Unikrishnayar, sir, uh, uh, Professor Nambur, sir, Satnarana, sir, C.S. Unikrishnayar, sir, Tiagarajan, sir, my colleagues, uh, distinguished professors, researchers, students, and all those join the join now to the 13th webinar in ROSE 2020. I also request your wholehearted support and participation throughout the program and also in the activities of the department. Thank you, sir. Over to Sopna. Thank you, sir, for the nice welcome address. Now, it is my great pleasure and uh, honor. I, I forgot to welcome Vijayan, sir. Vijayan, sir, 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 I missed you. <laughs> welcome you, sir. I missed you a lot. If any, I left anyone, please excuse me. Okay, so now. Thank you, sir. Now, it is my great pleasure and honor to introduce Professor Ajay Khattak. 
Professor Ajay Khattar did his MSc from University of Delhi, PhD from Cornell University, and was a research associate at Brookhaven National Laboratory. He joined IIT Delhi in 1966 and has recently retired from there as a professor of physics. He received the 2008 Spy <coughs> Award in recognition of his unparalleled global contributions to the field of fiber optics research and his tireless dedication to optics education worldwide. In 2003, he received Optical Society of America Esther Hoffman Beller Award in recognition of his outstanding contributions to optical science and engineering education. He is also a recipient of the CSIR SS Patnagar Award, 16th Harismi International Award, the International Commission for Optics Galileo Galilei Award, IETE Vardha Gold Medal, and the UGC Meghna Saha Award for his research work in fiber optics and related areas. He has authored over 170 research papers and several books, including the undergraduate text Optics, which has been translated to Chinese and Persian. His other books are Introduction to Fiber Optics and Optical Electronics, both co authored with Professor K. Tyagrajan, Quantum Mechanics, co authored with Professor S. Lognagan. His latest book is Albert Einstein A Glimpse of His Life, Philosophy, and Science. He received DSC from University of Badwan in 2007. He has been a visiting professor at several European, US, and Australian universities. <coughs> on my behalf and on behalf of the whole Opti Electronics Department, I welcome you, sir, to this webinar. And I also welcome all the invited guests and participants to our 13th webinar. We are all are eagerly waiting to start the session. I kindly request, sir, to start the presentation, sir. Thank you very much for your kind invitation to participate in this very important webinar series. I again thank uh, the organizers for asking me to deliver this talk. We have had several outstanding talks earlier in this series and it's a great effort and uh, this particular talk is going to be very simple particularly meant for students and I see extremely senior people joining so I feel a little embarrassed and uh, apprehensive but nevertheless these the talk is meant for students and uh, many of my colleagues have helped me to understand fiber optics and one of my great collaborators is Professor Tyagrajan, who I, whose photograph I saw just now, who, who is participating in this meeting. Then Professor I.C. Goel, Professor Anurag Sharma, Professor Arun Kumar, and many Professor Vishnu Pal, and many, many others. So with that, and uh, it was initiated, the whole activity was initiated by my senior, Professor Sudha, at IIT Delhi. Maybe someday I will give you a little bit of history about it. So I'm going to start today. And please uh, tell me about uh, five minutes before when I should stop. So why study of light has become suddenly so important? Or study of photonics? You know, UNESCO declared 2015 as the International Year of Light. And why 2015? Because it celebrated 1,000 years of the first book on optics, which was by Al-Hazan in Mesopotamia, which is now in Iraq, who wrote Kitab al-Manzir, which is the first book on optics. And to celebrate that, we had the International Year of Light. In proclaiming, and this is important, 2015 as the International Year of Light, United Nations recognized that applications of light science and technology are vital for existing and future advances in medicine, energy, information, communications, fiber optics, agriculture, mining, astronomy, architecture, archaeology, etc., etc., etc. Then UNESCO also declared later May 16th as the International Day of Light. This was two, three years back. Why May 16th? 
because the first successful operation of the laser was done by the U.S. engineer Theodore Maiman in California on 16th May 1960. And since then, we have been celebrating every year globally 16th May as the International Day of Light. And the advent, the discovery of the laser has revolutionized science. And these, these slides I'm particularly putting in because I find many of the engineering institutions have stopped teaching optics or photonics in their first year, even in IITs. And I think this is a step in a backward direction. Optics, photonics, quantum mechanics must be taught to the undergraduate students in engineering. The discovery, as you all know, of lasers has led to tremendous benefits to society in communications, healthcare, and many other fields. You have already heard many outstanding lectures. And one of the principal differences between the laser beam and the ordinary light beam is that it is highly directional, and therefore it can be focused to a very narrow spot. And so therefore, using focused laser beams, extremely important devices have been created for the industry and also defense. This particular photograph is from the Radha Ramanna Center for Advanced Technology in Indore. One of our former students, actually students of Professor Tagrajan and myself and everyone. Then we have a fiber laser cutting steel. The laser beam, as you all know, is, is it's extensively used for eye surgery. And then powerful laser beams can create temperatures which will result in generation of fusion power. This is still in research stage in the sense that the amount of energy that we are putting in is more is is more than the amount of energy that is coming out but hopefully very soon we will have output greater than the input and then we will have unlimited generation of fusion power and then i thought i will tell you the importance of photonics and the importance of such webinars series that many Nobel Prizes have been given. I will just name a few in the recent years. The 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded for groundbreaking inventions in the field of laser physics. Half of the prize money went to Arthur Ashkin, who was 92. Unfortunately, he passed away a few weeks back for his contribution to optical tweezers and their applications to biological systems. And Gerard Muru and Donna Strickland received the other half of the 2018 Nobel Prize in Physics for CPA. CPA stands for Chirped Pulse Amplification. And here is Gerard Muru and Donna Strickland receiving the Nobel Prize. And I thought I will tell you what is, what is CPA. You have an unchirped light pulse. You pass through a grating pair, pair in which the group velocity decreases with wavelength. It's a linear system. So the pulse gets dispersed. The pulse gets stretched and the peak power becomes smaller. When the peak power becomes considerably smaller, it can be amplified without damaging the amplifier. That is the beauty of the experiment. <clears throat> the pulse gets chirped. If you take the frequency spectrum, Fourier spectrum of this, it would be the same as this. So no new frequencies are generated. But the peak power comes, becomes smaller. So then it can be safely amplified to high peak powers. And then you pass through another grating pair or a device in which the group velocity increases with the wavelength. And it will compress. To, a, to a, uh, uh, compress the pulse and make it unchirped. And that is the basic principle of CPA, chirped pulse amplification. So such ultra-short, high-intensity laser pulses produced by 
CPA, chirped pulse amplification. Find extremely important applications in industry, for example, in cancer treatment, in many commercial products, in eye surgery, etc., etc. Indeed, since 2011, according to a report that I saw, CPA has been used in 24 million eye operations, just eye operations. So because of the tremendous impact, and you can produce terawatt lasers, uh, the Nobel Prize was given. And uh, in fact, using the optical tweezer technique, Stephen Chu, Kohan Tanuji, and William Phillips received the Nobel Prize, 1997 Nobel Prize in Physics, for development of methods to cool and trap atoms with laser light. So you can do very beautiful experiments, as most of you would know, using the laser beam. And then, as you all know, Denis Gobor the, received the 1971 Nobel Prize for his invention of holography. Here he is receiving the Nobel Prize. And then Glauber, Hall and Hans. I can go on and on for quantum optics, for laser-based precision spectroscopy. So it shows the importance of photonics. And then the 2014 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to Akasaki, Yamano, and Nakamura for the invention of efficient blue light emitting diodes. It's a revolution that has happened. And then the 2017 Nobel Prize in Physics was awarded to these three gentlemen for contributions to the LIGO detectors and observation of gravitational waves. So, what is LIGO? As you all know, it is Laser Interferometer Gravitational Wave Observatory. It's a huge Michelson interferometer. It's a gigantic Michelson interferometer. And 1.3 billion light years back, there was a violent collision between two black holes. And gravitational waves were created, which were detected by LIGO. The two arms of the LIGO had slightly different effects, which were recorded. And one could detect the, the violent collision. And you know, there is a LIGO setup that is planned in India. Hopefully, in my lifetime, I will be able to see. That is my hope. So I hope I have been able to tell you why study of light or of photonics has become extremely important, not only for students of physics, but more so in engineering. Each part. Is, you see, the new field of photonics has evolved. And I'm saying this because I'm a little disturbed to see many IITs now removing optics and photonics from their first year syllabus, replacing it by electromagnetic theory, which is also important. So one has to make a judicious choice. But photonics has become extremely important. I'm going to speak the basics, the fundamentals of fiber optics a technology that has created a revolution and has made phone calls and video conferencing free. Today we are doing, we are, we can see this throughout the world. It's a tremendous technological achievement. And it is because of the availability of low loss optical fibers and uh, laser diodes, which can be modulated with tremendous rapidity. As you all know, around 1864, James Clerk Maxwell predicted the existence of electromagnetic waves and said that light itself is an electromagnetic wave and whose frequencies go from radio waves, which are megahertz to gigahertz, and uh, then to X rays and gamma rays, which have very, very high frequencies. And the visible region occupies a tiny portion of the entire electromagnetic spectrum. And the wavelength starts from the blue region at 0.4 micron to red region, which is 0.7 micron. And the amazing thing is that all wavelengths, whether it is gamma rays to radio waves to infrared waves, they travel with an identical speed of 299792458 meters per second in free space. So this is now a universal constant. So the visible region of the electromagnetic spectrum, as I told you, 
goes from 0.4 micron in the blue region to 0.7 micron. The corresponding frequencies for 0.45 micron is about 600 terahertz. Tera is 10 to the power of 12, and this is around 500 terahertz. So, light guidance through the optical fiber. The material has a refractive index, which is defined to be C by V, where velocity C is the velocity of light in vacuum, and V is the velocity of light in medium. So when a light passes through glass, it bends towards normal. And you can show this by a simple experiment. And if the angle, if the light enters a rarer medium like air, then there is an angle at which there is a total internal reflection takes place. And this is a very beautiful experiment demonstrating the total internal reflection of light at the interface of water and air. This I'm sure all of you know. The first experiment which demonstrated light guidance through total internal reflection of light was carried out by Daniel Culloden and not by John Tyndall. Not by John Tyndall. And he demonstrated this simple experiment and you can do this at your home. You take a two liter Pepsi bottle, make a hole in it, let the light come out. And then you make a laser pointer point to the water that is coming out and the water, the light gets trapped inside the fire, inside the water. So this is the first demonstration of the guidance of the light beam because of total internal reflection. So you have here the core of the fiber and the cladding, which has a slightly smaller refractive index. This is usually pure silica. And this is pure silica doped with a little bit of germanium, so that the refractive index becomes larger. And so therefore, loosely speaking, the beam undergoes total internal reflection at the core cladding interface. Now, if you have a bare fiber, and then if it comes in contact with a material, then you have, then you can, light will leak out. And so therefore the necessity of a cladding, since light can quickly leak away from unclad fibers and hence the necessity of a cladding so that if there are other materials touching, light will not leak out here. And this concept of cladding goes to Van Heel in Holland and to Hopkins and Narendra Kapani in the United Kingdom. And I could not find photographs of Hopkins and Van Hill. I do have a photograph of Narendra Kapani, who was born in India, then studied in his days PhD in Imperial College, and then moved to and became an authority in the general area of fiber optics. So this is what the optical fiber looks like. This is the transverse cross section. And uh, for a single mode fiber, the diameter is about 5 to 10 microns. And uh, for a multi-mode fiber, this is about 50 microns. And this is the cladding, which has always a diameter. This is set up by some regulating authority to be 125 microns everywhere, so that they can be joined to any kind of fiber. And then there is a protective jacket. And even if you bend the fiber, total internal reflection takes place and light gets guided through. So this is an optical fiber and the light that comes out, because you can see the color, is because of Rayleigh scattering. So what is scattering? So you have, a, for example, an alpha particle, positively charged, and there is a positively charged nucleus, so it repels. So an alpha particle coming from a long distance, as you must have studied in your undergraduate class, gets scattered. So it deflects. So this, is this deflection, because of uh, the presence of a positively, is known as scattering. So here is a very simple experiment. 
that you have <clears throat> distilled water and a simple laser pointer. You can do this your, at your home. And then you put a few drops of milk. And uh, this is not really scattering. This is Tyndall scattering, actually. And uh, here you cannot see the light because there is very little scattering. There is some scattering by the water molecules, but not much. But because of the presence of the tiny drops of milk, it gets scattered. And therefore, you can see from the top. So this is what scattering is. And even when it comet goes near the sun, it deflects its position, its trajectory. That is also scattering. So the real scattering is proportional to, which is due to the atomics, at atoms is proportional to the fourth power of the wavelength. Higher the wavelength, smaller is the scattering. And so therefore, the red region, which has a higher wavelength, will undergo small scattering. And that is why sky is blue. Because uh, the blue component has a very small wavelength, and that gets predominantly scattered. And therefore, the sky is blue. The scattering by cloud is because of a slightly different mechanism, which is known as V scattering. I'm not going to just. And the setting sun is red because the blue component gets scattered out at the red component I see. So this is known as relay scattering. And it was actually discovered by John Tyndall. But Lord Relay gave the theory. And therefore, it came to be known as the relay scattering. Although many still call this as relay Tyndall scattering, Tyndall relay scattering, and so on. So here is a photograph I thought I will share with students of the man on the moon. Moon has almost no atmosphere, and so therefore, no relay scattering. So even during the noon time, the sky is dark. The the, the shadows are dark, and so on. There are three main areas in which the optical fiber plays a very important role, in image transfer, in optical communication, and in devices. I will try to cover all three of them. I don't know how much time there will be. So in 1930, Heinrich Lamm, a medical student in Munich, first assembled a bundle of transparent glass rods, fibers, to transmit an image. So you have a large number of fibers which are aligned. So the, this is the front end and this is the back end. This is the front end and this is the back end. So if, if you have a dark spot, you will have a dark spot here and the image gets transmitted. This is known as a coherent bundle. If they are not jumbled up, it is known as a coherent bundle. And uh, this is also a coherent bundle and a amplified image of that. And uh, you have each fiber is put like this. This is a this portion of the fiber bundle is shown here. And of course, one of the great great uh, application is in endoscopy, as I'm sure most of you know. This is a human hand holding thousands of such aligned fibers carrying light, and it can be put inside the human body, down the throat or through the anus, and uh, without uh, cutting open any portion of your body, one can see the inside of the human body. And in the photograph below, this is the stomach ulcer that is being investigated. And one can carry out this investigation. Here is a trying to find out the hair band swallowed by a patient, and you can also use this in killing the cancerous cell. So another application of the fiber optics, which has recently come up, is in fiber optic lighting. It is a plastic fiber, not glass fiber, plastic fiber, which has a, which has a 8 millimeter core diameter and 11 millimeter. This is not in microns, millimeter about a centimeter in diameter, solid core end glow fiber optic cable. 
So if this was propagated by someone in Argonne National Laboratory in the United States, Jeff Moose is his name. And it is light that is being transported. This is not solar energy. This is no electricity is coming up. You are just transporting light from the roof to the room. And uh, here is a plastic fiber that carries the light from the moon, uh, the, from the rooftop. Sunlight getting transported. And this is a very novel concept and it should be of great importance in India. So sunlight is received and carried through optical fibers to various rooms. And this is now marketed quite uh, routinely in, in Western Europe. And India, in my opinion, has so much of sunlight, particularly in northern states like Delhi, Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan, Uttar Pradesh, and Gujarat, that India must, I think this is a very not nice concept, but the cost of the plastic fibers is still very high. So here is an actual photograph of a room being lit by, by, by optical fibers from the roof. So you can imagine, we have so many villages which do not have electricity or which do have electricity, but we can, the, the, the colleges and schools can be lit by this. This is my own thinking. But I've been trying to propagate this, but somehow people seem not to be too interested. If they can make a profit in a country like Netherlands, then there is no reason why we should not do this in India. And it's not a very sophisticated technology. So this is the patent which describes the solar transport, solar power transmission. But the light transmission is very, I mean, the, they are very lossy and very expensive also. Let me go over to optical fibers and communications. Higher the frequency of the carrier waves, higher would be the information carrying capacity. And so therefore, it has been always the radio wave frequencies are in megahertz, microwave frequencies are in the region of gigahertz, and light wave frequencies are 100 terahertz. So it has been always engineers dream to use light frequencies for communications. And these are the typical bit rates that are required. Telephone requires about Voice communication requires about 64,000 bits per second. Standard television requires 100 megabits per second. And high density TV requires about gigabits per second. So you have here, this is a slide created by Professor Tiagrajan. You have a voice signal. Each signal is represented by eight bits. A number of pulses that are per second is so. In order to send frequencies up to 4,000, it has to be, there has to be 8,000 bits and 8,000 multiplied by 8 becomes 64 kilobits per second for a single voice channel. So you have an analog electric signal, you digitize it, you pass through the optical fiber and each pulse disperses and attenuates, disperses, broadens in time and attenuates. But if you are still able to detect each pulse, then you can retrieve the original signal. This is the basic layout of a typical digital transmission communication system. So in 1880, Graham Bell invented the first optical communication system. He called it the photophone, 1880. Many people say it was discovered by an Italian immigrant, Antonio Mucci. In this system, sunlight was modulated by a diaphragm. This is sunlight and transmitted through a distance of about 200 meters in, a, in air to the receiver containing a selenium cell connected to the earphone. This figure has been adapted from Graham Bell's original paper. 
So Granville, my here, of course, he's speaking on the telephone, but he let this he called as the photophone, photophone experiment. So that the photophone was the greatest invention I have ever made, greater than the telephone. Then between 80 and 1960, there was not much work in communication using light beam. When, as I told you earlier, a revolution occurred. The laser was fabricated. It first was open air communication, but the because of the air, dust, etc., it got at it it underwent very quick attenuation. So then in 1966, a very profound prediction was made by Charles Cow and George Hockham at the Standard Telecommunication Laboratory. They said, glass fibers represent a possible practical optical waveguide with important potential as a new form of communication medium, provided the tiny impurities in glass are removed and the loss is brought below 20 dB per kilometer. At that time, glass had a loss of about 1000 dB per kilometer, even more than that, 10,000 dB per kilometer. So if the impurities could be removed, then glass fibers, this is in 1966. So what is dB? So you have, if you divide input power to output power and take the natural logarithm of it, Law, sorry, log to the base 10, multiply by 10, that is, so if P2 is equal to P1, so this is log 1 is 0, so when 0 dB power loss means no power, no, no attenuation. If P2 is equal to half P1, then alpha 10 log 2 is 3 dB, 3 dB power loss corresponds to 50% power loss and so on by a path by if, if there is a power loss by a factor of 10 then there is 10 db power loss by a factor of 100 it is 20 db power loss by a factor of 1000 you have 30 db power so if you have an amplifier which has a gain of 30 db that means power amplification by a factor of 1000 i'm sure all of you are aware of this so in 1970 charles keck moira and schultz at Corning Glass Works in the US produce silica fibers having loss about 17 dB per kilometer. So this was a great revolutionary contribution that was made by these three scientists and uh, that started the optical communication. By 1980, so you see, Charles Cow predicted that the loss should be below 20 dB per kilometer. And they achieved 20 dB by 1970. Then more purifications were made. And by 1980, this is the loss curve of a silica fiber, of pure silica, as a function of wavelength. And the lowest, this is the Rayleigh scattering loss, because as I explained to you, Rayleigh scattering is 1 over lambda to the power of 4. So the, the loss becomes smaller and smaller as you go to higher and higher wavelength, reaches a minimum at 1.55 micrometer. It should be 1.55. And then it starts flaring up again. And these peaks are due to tiny amounts of water that remain in the fiber, which are difficult to remove. These are probably due to iron and cadmium. These are very difficult to remove, but they have been able to remove that. So the lowest loss, there is a window here at 1.33 micron or 1300 nanometers. So there is a lowest loss here. So imagine they wanted a loss below 20 dB. But they could achieve, technologists could achieve a loss of 0.2 dB per kilometer. So which is a great technological achievement. This is one of the greatest technological achievements of the last century. And has helped us to communicate. I still remember the time when I would call Bombay from Delhi and it would cost me 100 rupees for three minutes. And now it is free. Not only 
for a call to Bombay, but to also to London or New York, if your friend is there, you can talk to them. How has that revolution taken place? Because of the low loss optical fibers and there are some more. So the most optical communication systems that are being laid today are at this wavelength. So this is the, by sophisticated techniques, you can remove completely the water and this is the low loss curve that is fabricated in sterling, uh, sterlite industries in Aurangabad. Sterlite, I thought I will tell you that Sterlite is a company which is based in India and which has a huge manufacturing unit of low loss optical fibers and which, which exports optical fibers. Charles Kao received half of the 2009 Nobel Prize in Physics for groundbreaking achievements concerning the transmission of light in fibers for optical communication. And as I showed you, this is the photograph of Charles Kao in 1966, when he wrote that paper with George Hawken, but George Hawken did not get the prize that Charles Kao. These, these kind of things happen. These kind of things happen. Many people, that uh, recognition does not, uh, there is not, it is not fair often, and uh, there are many such instances. Uh, so the chair of the Nobel Committee said Charles Kao's discovery made in 1966, which was actually Charles Kao and George Hawkins, led to a breakthrough in fiber optics and revolutionized the way in which information can be transmitted globally. Sorry. So why glass fibers? Glass is a remarkable material which has been used for thousands of years. The main thing about glass is it does not solidify at a discrete freezing temperature, but gradually becomes stiffer and stiffer and eventually becomes hard. In the transition region, when it is soft and pliable, it can be drawn into a thin fiber. So you see, this is, there is a very nice fiber drawing research facility at CGCRI Kolkata. And they have very beautiful machines to draw the fiber. And when you heat the glass rod, it does not melt, it becomes soft. And when that happens, you can draw it in the form of a fiber. There was another breakthrough in 1970 that Alfa in Leningrad and and then Bell Labs, they produce room temperature operation of semiconductor lasers, which can be modulated very rapidly. And these are the sources for optical communication. Now, let me understand, let me tell you one device. I told you that there is a loss. Let us suppose I'm working at 0.25, uh, 1.55 micron. So the loss is about a quarter of a dB per kilometer. And quarter of a dB multiplied by 80 is 20 dB. So a 1 milliwatt pulse will become 10 microwatt. So there should be enough optical power at the receiver end for error-free detection. And so therefore we require optical amplifiers. In a conventional amplifier, the optical pulses are converted to elliptical pulses, which are amplified. And then they drive the laser to produce optical, amplified optical pulses. But can fiber losses be compensated optically? We can have direct amplification of optical pulses by using what is known as the erbium dope fiber amplifier. So in 1917, Einstein published an extremely important paper entitled on the quantum theory of radiation. So this is the spontaneous emission where an atom sitting at the higher excited state emits, a, emits light, which is known as spontaneous emission. We have stimulated absorption in which radiation of a proper frequency given by this 
can absorb the atom from the ground state and push it up to the excited state. Then he predicted stimulated emission, in which light of a particular frequency corresponding to E2 minus E1 sees an atom in an excited state and gets amplified. Many people say one photon becomes two photons. That is not correct. <laughs> that is not correct. I'll tell you later. Light gets amplified. So that is the acronym laser light amplification through stimulated emission of radiation. And that is given by this photo, by this diagram, by the process of stimulated amplification. Einstein predicted stimulated emission, but he did not think of amplification. And that light amplification was put forward by Richard Tolman in 1924. One must understand the contribution of Richard Tolman because he is often not, he is also not, not quite recognized as much as he should have been. Where he first said that the process of stimulated emission would amplify the light beam. So here, at normal temperature, larger number of atoms will be in the ground state, and fewer number of atoms will be in the upper state. So there will be what Einstein had predicted was the probability, as you all would know, probability of stimulated absorption is the same as the probability of stimulated emission. So the two probabilities are equal, and light gets amplified. Hey, sorry, the, the, this more since there are more number of atoms in the ground state, it will get absorbed lesser stimulated emission resulting in the attenuation of the beam. However, if you have a larger number of atoms in the ground's upper state, then there will be larger number of stimulated emission, smaller number of stimulated absorption resulting in the amplification of the beam. But this is not what you expect in thermodynamic equilibrium. So people never thought that you could obtain, see, there are many questions that are raised, that why it did the stimulated emission was discovered in 1916, why it took such a long time for the measure or laser to be discovered. And that is because people never thought that you can have a state of population inversion. It was Charles Towns in 1951 who suggested that we can have optical amplification by using population inversion. So I will tell you a very simple, very important device that you dope the core of the fiber with erbium, about 40 to 400 parts per million. So the core of the fiber, of the single mode fiber, has about 10 microns in diameter. The human hair has a diameter of about 100 micro or 70 microns. So this is the erbium, energy levels of the erbium in silica matrix. So this E3 minus E1 corresponds to 1.3 EV, which corresponds to 90, 980 nanometer wavelength. And so you have a pump which is operating at 980 nanometer, it will make the erbium atoms jump from E1 to E3. E3 has a very short lifetime of about one microsecond. So it immediately de-excites through a non-radiative transition. There is no photon that is emitted. And it comes to a state E2, which is a metastable state, which has a lifetime of 10 milliseconds. So this is, although it's a very small amount of time, but one, this is about 1,000 times, 10,000 times more than this. So you make the atom go to E3, and then it suddenly de-excites, 
And because this has a half-life which is very large, it just sits there. So if the pump power is large, then you will soon reach a situation, you can, so that the power, the number of atoms in level E2 is more than the number of atoms in level E3. So you can, this corresponds to about one point, these are broad energy levels. So you can, therefore, the, the emission is from 1.1, 1 .1, 1520 nanometer to 1570 nanometer. All wavelengths are there. So this slide is also by Dr. Tyagrajan. So I have a pump laser. This is the simple layout and which tells us the principle of optical amplification. I'm now telling the students. So you have here a pump laser at 980 nanometer. This is a coupler. And this is about 20 to 30 meters of erbium doped fiber. And it couples the 98 pump laser. And if this pump power is large, then you obtain a state of population inversion between E2 and E1. And if you have a signal at 1.55 micron or 1550 nanometer, then it will see a state of population inversion. And so therefore, it will get amplified. So in, in fact, those who are teaching lasers, when I used to teach to my first year students, I would first tell them optical amplification. And that is the acronym laser. Light amplification through stimulated emission of radiation. So I will first show them an RBM doped fiber. And I will tell them that how light gets amplified through the process of stimulated emission. And then you put the fiber between two mirrors, create a resonator, and you will produce a laser. So that way, I mean, fiber optics also allows you to understand very difficult concepts through very simple experiment in principle. So you have the RBM doped fiber. These are developed at Central Grass Ceramic Research Institute. And this is the schematic of an optical amplifier. And they also fabricated, commercialized at far. There is a company in Cochin, Nest. And uh, this is the ETFA production facility. I don't know how much they are selling, but uh, but we do have, but you should have many such facilities in India. This is a compact aluminum dope fiber amplifier. This is a 25 cent coin, which is about a two rupee coin in India. And this is a typical RBM road fiber amplifier, which has been fabricated by a company which is known as New Photon Technologies based in Los Angeles in the USA. And the president of the company is one of our students of Professor Tagrajan and myself, Dr. Ramdas Pillai. I always show this figure. So you can have a ETFA which is gain flattened, that is 30 dB. That is power amplification of 1000, 30 dB gain. And over, because the, 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 the width of the levels of the RBM atoms, you can have amplification from 1530 nanometer to 1560 or 1565 nanometers. So you can simultaneously amplify all wavelengths between this and this. So you have what is known as a wavelength division multiplexed system. As you can see, I have many, many slides from Professor Tyagrajan. So you multiplex a large number of wavelengths 
it has been shown by different colors, but they are actually in the wavelength region of 1.53, 1.515, 1.52, and so on. And it is multiplexed to one hair thin fiber. And this is an etfa. And then there is a fiber link. And then there is a dispersion compensator, which is also very beautiful physics. Someday I will tell you. And it gets amplified. And you have, because repeatedness transmission is about 80 kilometers. And you have, which is amplified by, periodically by erdium dope fiber amplifiers. So this is a very beautiful photograph, a slide. The erdium dope fiber amplifiers got started getting made around 1993. Before that, there used to be only one wavelength. And then by 91, a large number of wavelengths were getting simultaneously amplified through the optical fiber. And by 2001, there will be over 200 channels. Now it is much, much more. So you can have a total capacity of 100 terabits per second through one hair thin optical fiber. And because of that, the cost of communication has started. Has, this is an old photograph, but typical. It has started coming down. And now we have video conferencing free. So in 2001, Alcatel propagated simultaneously 256 wavelength channels through one hair thin optical fiber, sending 10.2 terabits per second information, which correspond to 150 million telephone channels. Because I told you earlier, 64 kilobits per second require, is required by one voice communication. So fiber connects us across the oceans, and there are millions and millions of kilometers of fiber that are being laid. And it's a, it's a great revolution that has taken place. And India has also participated in that. So this is a typical fiber cable that is being put under the ocean. And connecting, say, let us suppose New York and the uh, and London or Copenhagen or something like that. And in the inside there, you will have the uh, fiber amplifier and things like that. Even in India, this is a slightly dated photograph. Most big cities are connected through the fiber link. So the capacity, the information carrying capacity is doubling almost every year. So the RBM road fiber amplifier are extensively used in fiber-based optical communication systems. It was invented in 1987 by David Payne and his collaborators at the University of Southampton and Emmanuel de Servier and his collaborators at AT&T Bell Labs. The ETFA brought about a revolution in fiber optic communication systems. Fiber optics and development of ETFAs have made phone calls and video conferencing free. Now I'll tell you, that the three basic components of a laser are the active medium, which provides amplification, as I have just now told you, and an optical resonator, which provides a selection and optical feedback, and the pump. So I know I have told you about the pump and the active medium, but you put that between the two mirrors, and if the pump power is large, then this is the typical resonator, the working of a resonator, it goes back and forth and amplifies and you have an output. So, <clears throat> so the inside is always 20 times more than this, if there is a small transmission in mirror M2. So you, this is the basic, you see, this is how, as I told you, I used to teach lasers to my first year students. I would first tell them RBM road fiber amplifier and therefore the concept of optical amplification. 
and you have a diode pump which is which creates the inversion and then you put between two mirrors and you have optical amplification and you will have a laser so in 1961 elis schnitzer who passed away recently took a glass fiber whose core contained neodymium ions wrapped the fiber around a flash lamp and when suitable optical feedback was applied a laser was produced thus only one year after the demonstration of the first ever laser by theodore maiman the first fiber laser was born and it is a, again another revolution the fiber laser this is a 2 kilowatt fiber laser cutting through miles i have a small video but i i'm sure all of you have seen that so there is there are in rr cat radha ramanna center for advanced technology there is quite a bit of work going on in fiber lasers even in uh, nest kuchin they are making and in trivandrum also but the effort have to be much much more in my opinion the research and development in photonics there is lot of centers but in a country of 1.4 billion people there should be at least 10 times more laboratories like this to so require you see i always say there are outstanding students that we get we require leaders who can produce who can manufacture who can lead the country you see we have such bright students coming to iits and engineering colleges and universities we have to provide an atmosphere of learning and research large number you see <laughs> i don't want to sound political but if you ask me who was the greatest scientist born in india most of you will say c v raman because he got the nobel prize but in my opinion the greatest scientist born in india was homi bhaba vikram sarabhai who created institutions where if i do if i solve an equation or if i do a small piece of work and let us suppose i get a nobel prize it's a personal benefit the award that i have got it's a personal benefit but what bhava vikram sarabhai meghna saha has done have done Satish Dhawan, Abdul Kalam, Jamshed Ji Tata, they are the greatest scientists and technologists of our country, and we require people of such leadership qualities. Once we have that, then we have such outstanding students that we can achieve anything. so i tell because there are a large number of senior people <laughs> in the audience and i am also senior not senior very senior i feel that there have to be many institutions but we have to be very very careful in appointing the top person as a vice chancellor or a director who will provide the leadership to carry out research india is still a poor country 30% of the population is below the poverty line how do we remove that poverty only through science technology education science and technology that i am 100% convinced 100% today we have young children drinking out of water water from ponds we are a very poor country we are the privileged lot who have got a, who had good jobs and things like that so we have to provide leadership we have to produce leaders and not
necessarily, we should not worry whether we get the Nobel Prize or not. Many people have asked me that Simi Daman got the Nobel Prize, why not anyone after that? Okay, uh, how much I still have to do a little bit of uh, hyper gratings, but how much time do I have? Yes, sir. Actually, it is for one hour, but uh, uh, people are interested in hearing you, sir. Today is the highest number of more than 250 participants join at 10 hour waiting outside. And, so, uh, can I speak for 10, yes, sir. 10 to 15 more minutes? Yes, sir. Okay. <laughs> Those, you see, that is the advantage of webinar. Those who want to leave, they can leave. <laughs> okay. So there is laser welding and hole drilling and everything. So I will tell you a little bit about fiber drag gratings, and then I will finish in 10-15 minutes. So you have in a fiber, you have uniform refractive index, and uh, if you can have Periodic variation of refractive index, then you produce what is known as a grating. So you have, let us suppose, a glass surface, you put another material, and you know the beam getting reflected will be out of phase if the thickness is lambda by 4n. And you have all done this famous Newton's rings experiment where light reflected from the upper surface, lower surface of this plano-convex lens and the upper surface of this glass plate interfere to produce these beautiful fringes. I'm sure all of you have seen this. So if you have a large number of layers, then you can have reflection, which can be in phase. And produce an intense reflection at a particular wavelength, where capital lambda is the periodicity of the grating. So this is known as the Bragg wavelength, for which Bragg and Bragg received the Nobel Prize. I must tell you, the Bragg's law, Bragg's law was discovered by the son, William Lawrence Bragg. He was a student in Cambridge. He came and told his dad, who was a beautiful spectroscopist, and he then applied, did the experiments of that. So the original idea is of, of the sun. And the father got the idea from the sun. And many people think that the father told must have, that is not the case. I thought I will tell you that. So the two, father and son got the Nobel Prize. It's a great contribution. So you have layers such that a particular wavelength, all the wavelengths are in phase, and you will produce an intense reflection. OK. But if you shift the wavelength slightly, sorry, then if you shift the wavelength slightly, then the reflection from the first layer and n by 2 plus 1 layer will be out of phase and will produce a zero intensity. So you have, this is what a refractive index Bragg grating cors cors corresponds to. You have a broad spectrum of light. You have a core where there is a periodic variation of refractive index. And the reflected light is monochromatic. So you have white light incident, and the reflected light is monochromatic. Beautiful experiment, beautiful physics. <laughs> and here, this is an experiment done at CGCRI Kolkata, actual experiment. And this is the theory, and this is the experiment. One of the dots are the experiment, and the dashed curve is the theory. And the periodic variation is something like this. And you have the maximum intensity coming out at 1551 nanometer. And the, the, the width is about 1 nanometer. Width is only 1 nanometer. So that is the bandwidth of the reflected light. So what is the fiber product rating? Simple interference experiment tells us 
that you have a white light incident and the reflected light is monochromatic. Monochromatic with wavelength spread of about one nanometer or even less than that. So how do you fabricate? And these are naturally occurring fiber Bragg grating and Bragg gratings on the butterflies. Someday I will tell you. So when a, the, the, the fabrication is based on the principle of photosensitivity, when a germanium doped silica core fiber is exposed to ultraviolet radiation, the refractive index of the germanium doped region increases. So this is known as photosensitivity and it was discovered in 1978 by Kenneth Hill in Canada. So you have here two plane waves which is incident and it produces an interference pattern on the screen LL prime. So if the fiber is exposed to a pair of ultraviolet beams at 240 nanometers, 240 nanometers which is in ultraviolet sorry. Then what will happen is just like in the previous curve you have two beams interfere. This is done everywhere <laughs> in, in all optics books including my own. And uh, they will produce an interference pattern on the this is the cladding and this is the core. And so once the interference pattern is produced, when there is maximum intensity, the refractive index will go up. Because the core is doped with germanium. And germanium is photosensitive. And so you produce, because it will produce an interference pattern, the dark fringes will not change the refractive index, and the bright fringes will change the refractive index. You can change the angle and the periodicity will change. So by changing this angle of the interfering beams, you can change the periodicity of the grating. So this is a typical fiber Bragg grating writing facility. There are many such writing facilities that are there. So you have a broadband source, white light source, let us suppose. So here is one grating with one periodicity. It reflects lambda 1. This reflects lambda 2. And this reflects lambda 3. So that this grating, this fiber is put inside a bridge, let us suppose. Inside the floor of the bridge. So the light that gets reflected, when I see this wavelength, I know it is reflected from here. When I saw this, this wavelength, I, I know that it is from here. Professor Tiagrazen has shown them with different colors. They are really not of different colors, but slightly different wavelengths. Of course, they have, therefore, they have different colors. So you put that on the bridge. And then there is a strain. Let us suppose there is a crack. And the periodicity changes. And because the periodicity changes, the peak wavelength changes. And then you can say that something has happened there. And this you can observe 100 kilometers from the bridge. You don't have to have a station there. This is a bridge in Norway, but now all civil structures have large number of fiber drag gratings, fiber gratings embedded inside the structure. So there was a bridge in Minnesota which killed a large number of people. This is an actual video. And people say that the fiber sensors, if they were put inside the bridge, this would never have happened. We could have checked the, monitored the health of the bridge by putting fiber sensors.
So here, the fiber bracketing manufacturer made by CGCRI, they put it on the cable wire and detected their temperature, how, how hot they were. And uh, they were, they collaborated with Power Grid Corporation of India, put the fiber bracketing sensor here and uh, it was led by Kamal Das Gupta and uh, Tarun Bandopadhyay and also others. So this is the place where you see, you want to know an accurate measurement of temperature. And these are very high voltage cables. And so therefore a dielectric sensor like FBG is very, very useful. So you have a temperature sensor which can measure the temperature of two fiber bracket. And if the temperature goes up, then you should be careful. So it tells you the temperature. The rest decision is, of course, yours. So here you see, this is a schematic of a master oscillator power amplifier, MOPA. So you have a RBM dope fiber. And you don't use mirrors now. You put a grating here. So grating acts as a mirror. So if I want to transform an amplifier to a laser, I just write a grating at the ends of the fiber. So this is my seed laser. And then it is passed through another amplifier and then an isolator. So I'll conclude by doing one more experiment. And that is, maybe I should stop here. Yeah, maybe I should stop here. So there are n number of things that one can do. And uh, nonlinear optics also you can do. And super continuum generation through the optical fiber, through nonlinear effects, the solitons in optical fibers, and so on and so forth. So I will tell you the references. It is 12.18. So this is a book that I had the privilege of writing with Professor Tyagrajan. And some of the simpler things I've tried to put in my optics book. And uh, then there are several other books that have come up that we have been involved in. And uh, this is by edited. These are all edited books. This is by Dr. Shamal Bhatra. This is by Dr. Pal. And this is by Dr. Anurag Sharma. Then we had a software. Actually, it was quite a nice software that was created by Dr. Ramanan Tiwari and Dr. Anurag Sharma. And now we have a software which Dr. Vashne and Dr. Vipul Rastogi from IIT Roorkee and then there is some experiments book. And then this is a little, uh, we wrote for school students, 12th class students, the two revolutions. Somehow it didn't sell well, but doesn't matter. Thank you for your attention.